So my interest started on 9-11, as I'm sure many other people in this room did. My hospital, Bellevue, is located about two miles away, and lucky me, I happened to be on duty that morning, and I can tell you it was a very, very eventful day. And now that there's a whole science behind all of this and decontamination, I can also tell you that day we probably did just about everything wrong. So hopefully we've learned a bit and we're gonna discuss what we've learned today. Sadly, no one pays me any money to hawk anything, so I have nothing to declare. Today we're gonna talk about pediatric decontamination, but I think to do a good job, we need to discuss a little bit about the differences in children, how they're different physiologically as well as behaviorally. We're gonna touch on how we need to triage them we're going to talk a little bit about pre-decon interventions, things we can do prior to actually getting them in the shower, different antidotes, things we can use, and we're going to spend the bulk of our time actually talking about the entire decon process, soup to nuts. Why do we care? Children are probably our most important resource, yet we don't protect them the same way that we do other resources. Think about the security at your bank, your airport, your military base. Now think about the security at your elementary school. Very different. Children are very labor intensive, right? Takes a lot to get them through a decon process, way more bodies than we're going to need for an adult. You need specific equipment. You definitely need specific training. We do not train nearly enough in general, and when we do, we have a tendency to leave out kids. This next slide, I apologize, is a little graphic, all right, but chemical things and disasters happen. On the left is Bhopal, India, back in 84 when methyl isocyanate was released into the environment. So that was an industrial accident. On the right is purported chemical weapon use in Syria. So things can come in a chemical variety. Things can come in a radiation variety, such as Fukushima, Japan, very recently. Um, but this is India, this is Syria, this is Japan. It can never happen here, right? Well, it can and we're gonna to need to be prepared for that. How are children a little bit different? They're at risk for many, many different reasons. They fail to recognize danger. If somebody started shooting in this room, I'd duck behind this podium. Little kid's gonna stand there, and he's gonna be looking all around. They make easy targets. They are unable to rescue themselves. If there was a fire and I was in a second floor room, I'd jump out the window. I might break a leg, so what? Many a fireman has found a kid dead of smoke inhalation, hiding under the bed, hiding in the closet. They don't have that judgment that an adult has. They're not able to get themselves out of trouble. They're unable to report exposures. Children are crawling all around. Toddlers put everything in their mouth, right? If you leave it on the floor, they will eat it. So they can't tell you what they ate. You're just going to see that they're getting sick. And if you think about camp, school, they tend to come in large clusters, right? We keep them together. So it makes a tempting target if you're evil. Children are at more risk for chemical um, stuff, right? They have higher minute ventilations. They breathe faster. Many chemicals are heavier than air. They congregate lower to the ground. That's where the kid is. He's way down here breathing. That and a faster respiratory rate makes them way more susceptible to inhalants. They also have a far greater surface area to body mass ratio. Their skin is more permeable, right? They get dehydration very, very easily and fluid loss, but they're also able to absorb more. 
If we think about radiation, right, they're young, they're still growing, they have lots of rapidly dividing cells. Infants in particular have immature immune systems. Um, and so if you think about increased uptake with a, hopefully a nice long lifespan, you get a way, way higher incidence in your risk of cancer down the road. Um, the best studied of this has probably been thyroid. Let's talk about some pre-hospital issues. Many first responders are somewhat inexperienced with kids. All right, you practice a lot of adults, drills for children way, way less. Children have very different vital signs than adults have. If I went to the normal newborn nursery, I'd find the child, his heart rate would be about 140, he'd be breathing in the high 30s, and his systolic blood pressure would be 70s. Healthy, happy baby, you'd be in the medical ICU. Not the same beast, children are not small adults, they have to be handled and thought of very, very differently. Normal behavior in a child, they tend to regress when stressed. They are not going to be cooperative and help you out. They are going to tend to act younger than their stated age. They're going to sort of involute, turn in on themselves. They may just sit and cry. They may suck their thumb. But they are not going to be like, oh, yes, I'll do everything you say and follow you around. We don't prep for kids. We don't do nearly enough drills. And the ones we do almost exclusively use adults. I can tell you in my hospital, sometimes we sneak a kid or two in there, right? But it's usually your kid, okay? So they're on like best behavior, they're all happy, they're missing a day of school, they're in their bathing suit, you hose them off, they get to put on some makeup. It's a lot of fun and games. Not very realistic, right? Boston Children's has a lovely video where they've done a big decon process on children. It's probably the only one of its kind out there. And it's kind of sterile. Everyone's listening. Everyone's doing exactly what they're told. There's absolutely no sense of panic in there at all. It's not what we're going to get. We're going to get something very, very different. You need to have appropriate pediatric equipment and medications for you if you're going to be out in the field as a pre-hospital provider. You can always size down equipment in an adult. You can't size up equipment in a child. All right, so if you have a one-year-old, you can't stick an 8.0 ET tube in them and a 16-gauge IV. Not going to work. Won't fit. All right, you better have some pediatric equipment with you on the bus. As far as medications, how many four-year-olds can swallow a pill? Very few, all right? So you're going to need liquid medications. You're going to need to think about ways that you can do pediatric dosing. Finally, and I think in combination with vital lack of awareness of different pediatric vital signs, we frequently see errors in triaging children, usually to their benefit, right? So well kids I've seen get rushed into my hospital ahead of sick adults. Um, so it benefits the child, but not the overall disaster. I think you're going to get an entire lecture on this this afternoon, so I just want to touch on it very briefly. Four categories of disaster triage, black expected to die, red emergent life-threatening, yellow urgent, and green is your walking wounded or well. This is Lou Romig's jump start disaster triage. Uh, on the right is a combination with the adults. If you look at the differences, it's largely with respiratory rate, right? Because children will breathe faster or slower. And we have a few different things there. I want to point out up here, because this is the part that I have some trouble with. And I think many other people will too. If you're not breathing and you have no pulse, you're dead, okay? That's an easy one. Um, but if you have a pulse and you're not breathing, we're going to give you five rescue breaths to see what happens. If you start breathing on your own according to this flow sheet, we save you. 
If you don't, we consider you dead. Now you still have a pulse and a blood pressure. This is a tough one, all right? This is the kid that I, as a pediatric emergency doc, have trained all those years to save every other day of my life. Chances are the first couple of kids that come in who meet this criteria, I bet people are gonna still be working on, all right? If you get completely overrun and overwhelmed, that's one thing, but you wanna make darn sure you're getting a lot of victims uh, in a mass casualty before you let this kid go. Let's talk a little bit about decon, since that's what our topic is. So most of the time you're not gonna know what the agent is, but you'd love to, right? You'd love to get a good risk assessment. So what do you wanna know? You wanna know what they were exposed to, how much of them was exposed, what route, how long. Often at the beginning you won't have this information, but as disasters play out over time, often it trickles into you. Good ways to get information is your local poison center. They are an outstanding resource. 800-222-1222 uh, should connect you via a longer route to your local poison center. Um, because every local jurisdiction is slightly different. There's some good websites for the CDC that will have information. And while I have no you know, interest in them as a company, there's a great web app for your phone called Wiser, W-I-S-E-R. You can download it for your iPhone that goes into all different chemical stuff. It gives you all the disaster protocols. It's a very, very useful tool, and you have it. It's there with you. You don't need to rely on the internet or anything else that may be down during your disaster. How do you suit up? If it's a bio or a radioactive, really you just need to be covered, right, from head to toe. You don't want any skin exposed, so regular old, trauma gear, mask, goggles, some kind of face shield, all of that will work just fine. If it's an unknown agent, but there are no signs or symptoms of any sort of nerve or organophosphate poisoning, I would wear a splash suit, uh, but you don't necessarily need the whole papper or breathing equipment. If it's a wet liquid, or there are any signs or symptoms of a nerve agent, you want to be in your full gear. So you want to bring your pappers, your splash suits, tape your seals, everything. It is better to overdress yourself than underdress yourself if you are unsure. I would always, always encourage my staff to overdress. All right? The worst thing in the world during a disaster is when your triage nurse starts to fall on the ground having seizures. You want to bring your ED to a stop, that's how to do it. All right, so protect yourself, be ready, air up. That being said, as a general rule, most patients are okay, right? Some will come in by ambulance and be very, very sick, but a lot of them are just going to kind of run or stampede your way. As a general rule, your hospital staff will have way, way less exposure than the patient had, so if the patient's looking okay, you're probably gonna be okay too. All bets are off if the patient looks sick, all right? And it is very, very important to do a second decon, even if you believe one was done in the field prior to the victims arriving at your hospital. We learned a very, very valuable lesson from the Tokyo attack, sarin attack, in Japan, if you looked at what happened there, they didn't decon patients, they just like rushed them right into the hospital, put them where they needed to go, and of course the sickest group went to the ICU, and roughly 30% of their nursing and other staff up there showed at least one sign or symptom, okay, of nerve gas toxicity. Um, so it debilitated quite a number of their staff, which greatly impaired their ability to care for these patients. So never ever assume a patient was properly decontaminated. 
unless you've done it yourself in your institution. What do you worry about? Sludge. All right. Good mnemonic for organophosphate poisoning. So salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI distress, or emesis. This is bad, right? You see this on a patient, put on the full suits, start worrying, okay? What do you do? Well, there are some antidotes for this. So atropine and tupam. Dosing of atropine, 0.05 mg per kg IM, which is most likely how you're going to give this, or 0.02 mg per kg IV. Remember, this, your patient probably isn't through and in your hospital yet. They're symptomatic. We want to do something before you get your whole decon thing set up and done. You're going to be in those clunky suits with those big gloves. You're doing this IM. If it looks like a toddler, make life easy, round. Give them a half a milligram. If it looks like a child, give them one milligram. And if they're almost as big as you are, give them a regular adult dose, which is two milligrams. These can be all made in pre-made syringes once you realize you have a problem. Right, the first patient who shows up is always a problem, but after that you can get yourself ready. Someone can be loading a whole lot of these things up so that they're ready to go and you have them ready for your use. Tupam or prelidoxime, it's 15 mg per kg IM or 20 to 50 IV over 15 minutes. This is probably going to be given after your secondary decon um, and in the hospital. Uh, but if first responders are out in the field and you have a long transit time, there you go, 15 per kilo IM. The auto injectors come with 300 per ml and you can give a max of three times. If you think of an adult kit, which is the Duodot kits, right, Mark 1s are gone, they have 600 of 2 PAM and 2.1 milligrams of atropine. How do you assess for radiation? Regular old Geiger counter. You're just going to run it over your patient. It's going to start click, click, clicking, or it isn't. Very easy. While there is no antidote for radiation poisoning, there is a way to prevent radioactive iodine uptake in your thyroid gland, and that is with the use of potassium iodine. So where is the radioactive iodine? Either in nuclear explosions or nuclear reactor incidents. You do not need potassium iodine for a dirty bomb. There is no radioactive iodine present there. How do you dose it? Like this. <laughs> so different milligrams by age. It's typically taken for 10 days. There are liquid preps available. They're a little bit harder to find. If you look around in your medicine cabinet and you see something called tincture of iodine, that is not a good substitute. That is poison. Do not drink it. <laughs> the federal government, in the event of a large-scale incident like that, does have push packs that are ready um, and usable. These can be delivered anywhere in the United States within a 12-hour time period. Uh, this is CDC stuff. This is mostly Cipro during the anthrax scare. If you look way over here, that's a fully grown man, okay, to give you some sense of the size of this thing. It's absolutely enormous. They don't tell you where these are located for obvious reasons. Um, how much of that is liquid or child friendly? Nobody really knows. They're not, government's not going to say. Let's change gears now and talk a little bit about our hospital. Our number one goal is to protect our facility. That means early activation. All right, patients, depending how far your hospital is, can get there really quickly. I don't know what your specific hospitals have by way of decon. Many, many hospitals have to set up a tent or something on the outside. You've got to connect it to water. You've got a whole lot of things to do. 
if you look at this, this is not a one-man job, right? You need a whole bunch of big, strong people. It doesn't typically come with one flick and it's easily assembled. You need some people to practice this. You need more than two or three guys who are very gung-ho and want to do it all the time. They're probably not going to be around when you have the real one. So you need to spread this out over your staff. Don't just drill the day people. Everyone does their drills Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Okay, what happens at 11 p.m. on a Sunday night? Who's around? Who knows how to build this? These are important questions for your hospital. So the second you have a hint that something's going on, you're better off setting this up and going, oh, well, we didn't need it. That was good practice than fumbling around having the ambulances lining up at your door. Now, I get spoiled. I have a very different setup at Bellevue where I am. We have a pre-made freestanding shower that's sort of attached to the building right outside our ambulance bay entrance. We sort of call it the car wash. There's eight different, you know, stations within here. Each station has seven nozzles, and it just blasts you. Right? It is an absolute deluge in there. Other issues that hospitals face. You may not be a pediatric center. You may not have pediatric emergency physicians. Your hospital may not have a peds ICU. You may not have burn people or trauma people like Jessica or ped surgeons. Right? You're going to have to make do with what you have. You may have a lack of supplies. You may have very limited ward beds, limited equipment, limited oral liquid medications. For longer disasters, things like Hurricane Katrina, all right, imagine working in the nursery when you run out of diapers, baby food, and formula. Now what are you going to do? All right, that went on for months. Not an easy solution to some of these. But you want to think about your supplies of all these different things and where you're going to get more should a dis large-scale disaster happen to you. Back to our children. So they have poor regressive communication skills. We talked about that. We talked about their inability to follow directions. They may be totally unwilling to disrobe or separate from the items they care about. They constantly require supervision. Many of them are afraid of water. And they're little emotes, as we've heard earlier, right? If you're scared, they're going to sense that they're going to get scared too. So very often the caregivers are very emotionally involved. Um, if we're freaking out, it's not going to go well for the child. We need to present a very calm exterior. Hard to do, right? Because the overlying thing during these disasters with children is fear. We think of ourselves as these great rescuers who are putting ourselves in harm's way to help them, which is great and very noble. But this is what the kid sees, okay? Luke, I am not your father. I am actually a masked stranger adult. First thing I'm going to do is take away your blanket and teddy bear. Then, I want you to follow me, take off all your clothes, and we're going to shower together. <laughs> That's what we do. Not the message we typically send our children on every other day. We have to overcome this somehow. They should be scared of us, all right? So, once patients start arriving, again, never ever assume that anyone is decon prior to getting there. Roughly 60 to 80 percent of people who can will just bypass EMS and run to the nearest hospital, particularly in a large urban center where I work and the distances are very short between hospitals. And the closer you are to the ground zero, the more at risk you are for patients just self-presenting. 
But really the first thing you have to do from an administrative point in your hospital is separate out those patients who are arriving who could be contaminated, i.e. they were at the incident, from those patients who have absolutely no chance of being contaminated. So great-grandpa who watched the thing blow up and collapse on television and now is coming in with chest pain from his heart attack, all right, he does not need to go through the decon. All right, but he should not come in contact with anyone who might. So you need a totally separate entrance for patients to get into the hospital who have no involvement um, in this event. And again, undressing is 90 plus percent. What can we do while the guys are still setting up that tent and turning on the water? All right, patients may already be outside your hospital. We can do a lot for them there. We can certainly do basic airway maneuvers. We can control hemorrhages. We can give IM antidotes. Plenty of things we can be doing to help stabilize them prior to them actually getting in to the hospital. Keep families together. The caregiver is your absolute best friend. Process people at the level of the highest level of acuity. So if you have a family of four and one's a red and the others are green, they're all going to go through as a red. All right? You want to keep these people together, particularly the parent and the child. The child is going to be way, way more comfortable if they have that parent around. The one exception to separating things is when the parent's critical. All right? If the child is critical and the adult is well, the adult's going to stay with their kid. There's no question about that. They are not going to leave that side. They can get help later. If the adult is critical, but the kid's totally fine, that is one situation where you may want to separate them out. We definitely have come a long way with parents watching resuscitation of their children. I don't know that there's really any good data the other direction. I believe it would probably be best to get the kid out of there, distract them somehow, and do what you need to do. You're going to need more help. Children are afraid of the water. You may need to use handheld sprayers. They're not going to be able to wash themselves well, but they're going to want to try. Okay, so the young children are like, I can do that myself, but they're going to do a lousy job, right? So they need a lot of supervision. And don't forget that they have modesty issues. Just because they're a child doesn't mean they're not embarrassed about their body, doesn't mean we should ignore privacy or simple signs of respect that we would prefer to have should that be you, okay, going through these things. Perhaps the biggest one is fear of hypothermia. All right. Again, children have that greater body mass to surface area ratio. You want that water hot. You can't just turn on a fire hydrant and aim it at these kids. They're all going to have hypothermia. You'd like your water to be a minimum of 98 degrees. Somewhere in the 98 to 104 range is probably ideal. If it's freezing, your kids are going to be freezing. If you're like us, we tend to run our drills in the summer, so it's beautiful out. How much snow did you guys get this winter? Run your drill in winter. And, that, and think about where you're setting up your tent, okay? Because if you put it three or four football fields away from the front door of your hospital, you got to get from the tent, freezing cold, naked, okay, all the way into the hospital. You can freeze right there. So you need to plan where you're putting this fairly carefully. You got to ID your patients. You need to know who you have. So if you come in with a caregiver, that's great. You can link them. Things like maternity ID bands are wonderful because you can link sort of baby to mom. That works fabulous. If they're unaccompanied, now you have a problem. What's your name? Mm -mm. They may not even tell you. You've got a lot of kid John Does. If you have time, 
It's best to take pictures of them before you get them completely undressed. Often what they're wearing, their backpack, their clothing, can often be very helpful with family reunification at the end of this disaster. All right, if they're critical, do what you gotta do, okay? But most of them won't be. Take the time, get some pictures. You'd like a close-up of their face, you'd like a close-up of the entire child. You will then take this data and eventually report it to some data bank, so, such as the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or in New York, we often use HERDS, right, the Hospital Emergency Resource Database System. These are both large data banks that will help us reunify children. If you thought of Hurricane Katrina, that was probably one of the largest events in this country. They had over 3,000 displaced children initially with no adult caregivers for them. And the military actually took that over. They came up with Operation Child ID. They took them all up to some military base in Camp Gruber, Oklahoma, and they sorted it all out there um, over a period of weeks. Once they've been seen medically, right, a lot of them are gonna be fine. But if you don't have an adult to hand them off to, right, you can't just discharge them. They gotta stay in your hospital. So you need a well-staffed, safe area that you can put these kids until the adults start coming in to collect them. You'd like it to be secured, so few exits. You'd like staff in there. You'd like no hazards in there. And ideally, some age-appropriate distractions, so movies, coloring books, something, storytelling. Anything that's gonna keep them calm and not thinking about what just happened or what's going on around them. For disrobing, everything has to come off. All right, each individual should take all their clothing, put it in a bag. If you have big, clear plastic bags, those are great because then should it turn out not to be a contaminant, everyone's gonna want their stuff back and then it's easy to locate. Um, but regular old hefty works just fine. Uh, jewelry, wallets, keys should go in sort of Ziploc sandwich bags in a separate pile so that that can all be secured depending on whether you can get it back or not, depending on the agents involved. You need to ensure warmth between the disrobing area and getting into the shower and you need to protect people's modesty. You can't just sort of put up a screen, you're going to see footage from the evening news all right, with the helicopter above with lots of naked people running from one site to another. So they need to be covered with something. Could be a sheet. They make these sort of privacy ponchos that you can put on. It comes in a package. There's two parts in it. The first part is to get you from the disrobing area into the front of the shower. The second part you'll undo once you're through the shower. It'll give you a little thing to dry off, a little micro towel. You'll put another you know, poncho over the top of you and you'll enter the hospital wearing the poncho. I have not seen these made specifically for children, so they're gonna be sort of a big trailing dress, uh, but they do work. We talked about temperature. How long do you actually have to stay in there? Nobody really knows. There's no set time limit. You do need to wash your entire body, head to toe, no exceptions. If patients arrive already with bandages or dressings in place, they all need to be taken down. That's where the wounds are. Those are the places that are most likely to actually have contaminant in them. You'll do it all back up on the other end. It's f most places use plain old water. It is fine to add a mild liquid soap, things like dishwasher soap, or not dishwasher, but liquid, you know, the hand stuff, <laughs> palm olive kind of <laughs> stuff. Um, works fine. Many places will use sponges and big buckets. Um, that works fine too. Do not use bleach. Do not use other harsh or abrasive chemicals. 
water is really your best. If your patients arrive on a long board and sea collar, probably going to be using handheld sprayers on them. Remember, you need to log roll them and do the backside, even though they're on the board. So you're going to need quite a few people out in your hot zone. You're going to need some strong people out in your hot zone. This is a lot of work. This is a breakdown, I guess from my paper, going over the different categories. So we tend to break the kids down into non-ambulatory and ambulatory. And then within ambulatory, there's going to be three groups depending on age. The non-ambulatory definitely are your sick ones, right? These are probably all going to be your red patients. If there's a caregiver, still use them. Have them stay at the bedside or the stretcher side as you're going along. They can be very, very helpful in terms of calming the patients down. You may have a rack system. If you do, that's great. You can bring them through on that. If you don't, you're going to simply take a hospital stretcher, stick the long board on the hospital stretcher, handheld sprayer, hose them in the front, log roll them, somebody's going to hose down the back. That's what you're going to do. If you're in a setup like mine, which has a ton of water, protect their airway. All right, children have problems. If you leave them in a fixed form, staring up, and the water comes straight down, that's how to drown somebody, particularly if you have a high flow setup like I do in Bellevue. If you're ambulatory, now we're going to separate you by age. This is the easy group, right? That 8 to 18s, these can almost all be treated like adults. Right? You're going to want to separate them by gender. They're all going to need their modesty insured. Particularly the 8-year-old is going to need a whole lot more supervision than the 17-year-old. Um, so somebody's going to need to be keeping an eye on these patients. They are minors. Um, therefore, you're going to want to have both genders in the hot zone. You're going to want to have a female looking after the females and a male looking after the males. The two to eight year old group, this is the group that's going to give you the most trouble, right? Because they can fight back. Separate them by gender if you're able, all right? Below eight, people vary on that. Probably not critical. You can mix boys and girls if it's easier to do so at your institution, but some of them might prefer to be separated out. This group is what gums up the line. All right, they are going to go through very slow. They're going to want to wash themselves. They're going to be afraid. This is the group that's going to be throwing tantrums outside, going, I don't want to go in there. We're going to have to insist. All right, eventually we're going to have to get them in. The good news is if they can throw a tantrum, they're probably not that sick. All right, so you have time. You can rush the red ones and the people acutely symptomatic through first, hopefully give things a chance to calm down. Hopefully a caregiver or some known figure to the child can arrive and help you out. Um, but they definitely need extensive supervision. Again, caregivers are a godsend. Never ever turn one down. <laughs> Infants present their own different risks. All right? Never ever ever let a parent carry their baby through a decon shower. It is impossible for them to adequately wash themselves and their infant. Children are slippery. They will get dropped. How many, what number of dropped children is acceptable? My answer is zero. So we need to figure out a way to not do that. And the easiest thing is this very high-tech piece of equipment, all right, called a laundry basket with holes in it. It'll actually contain the child well. All right? It's full of holes, so the water will drip itself out. You can put it on a stretcher so that the whole thing just lines itself right through. No drops, no fuss, very easy. I think Nassau sells them for a couple of thousand a piece. <laughs> um, but if you think ahead of time, this is something that every place could probably have and keep with their disaster supplies. 
And if you get infants or s very small children, it's going to make your life way, way, way more easier. If you don't have this, you need to put the baby on a stretcher and literally keep a hand on him the entire time as you're going through decon. You cannot let go. This means you're going to have two people for that infant, because one's going to essentially be holding him, and the other one's essentially going to be washing him. Very more labor intensive. And I will also add, they are the greatest risk for hypothermia and airway issues, because they can't protect themselves, and they can't even tell you when they're freezing cold. Just when you think it couldn't get any worse, okay, now comes the special needs kid. <laughs> All right, this group presents its own challenges. Um, they generally have increased risk. They're often not quite at their normal mental age. They often have sort of poor protoplasm. They have some debilitating form of illness, so they're not quite as much reserve as a regular healthy child has. They may come with appliances. They may come with trachs and GTs and home ventilators. All right? Particularly if they're symptomatic, you got to take all this stuff out, unfortunately. You're going to need to decannulate these kids. You're going to need to remove these appliances. If they're grossly soiled, they've got to stay in the hot zone. If they're not, and they're water, you know, resistant, you can, in fact, decon the equipment and send it on through as well. Trust me, it can all be replaced as soon as you get to the other side, but if you have an inhalant when a kid with a trach who's symptomatic, that's got stuff in it. You're going to need to worry about this. Again, caregivers are fabulous. Oops. So this is just the same slide if people get the breakdown. Once you're out of the shower, okay, dry kids immediately. Very prone to hypothermia. We cannot emphasize that enough. All right, they need to be covered for warmth and modesty, and all children need to be re-triaged once they come out of the shower. Just because you were a green or a yellow on the way in, doesn't mean that you are on the way out. Children are dynamic, as are adults, all right? And their symptoms may have changed in the intervening time period. So everyone should be re-triaged on the other end. Ensure proper ID for tracking and reunification purposes. So again, if you had time prior to the shower, get those pictures. If you didn't because they were sick, get them as they're rolling by out the other end. Post-medical eval, we talked about our child-friendly area. I just kind of want to put a plug for psychiatric services. So children not only need to get through the acute event, but they need to sort of grow and develop into regular healthy adults. If you look at studies, children survivors of major trauma tend to have vast personality shifts pre-accident and post-accident. They are very, very different people as a result of this. So these are big deals, decon events. The actual event is going to be terrifying to a child. The decon process might, in fact, be terrifying to a child. Their future is going to be different. The child may be OK, but they may have lost a loved one or friends or their home may be destroyed, so they're not going back to their familiar environment or their school. These are all going to have lasting and profound effects on the patient. So I urge you all to stay for the mental health lecture. I think we're getting at the end of the day. Um, I don't know how he's going to actually cover all that in an hour. It's a huge, huge topic uh, worthy of a whole day in and of itself. So some quick take-home points. Plan ahead. Train, retrain. Try and include children in your drills as much as possible. I get their limitations. We can't go around like terrorizing children in schools, so we're sort of left with our volunteer, you know, children sub-base. Um, 
it's better than nothing, but keep in mind that the real thing is probably not going to be quite as sanitized and easy. Children are at greater risk. They breathe faster. They have greater surface area. They fail to recognize danger. They're much more labor intensive during the decon process. They're not going to help you. They have regressive behavior. Very, very important to know who you have, particularly in pre-verbal children. ID tracking is absolutely critical to this process from a hospital point of view. You may be required to give antidotes in the field or before you get through the shower. Therefore, you need somebody peds trained on the outside in that hot zone who knows what they're doing and how much to give and when to give and can make those assessments important for your planning purposes when you're deciding who to suit up. Finally, for the shower point of view, everyone and everything must go through the decon. There is one exception that a lot of people seem to make, and that's for radiation incidents. If you're covered in radioactive dust, but you have an acute life-threatening injury, Many experts recommend that you be brought into the hospital, treated for your life-threatening injury. You can kind of cover the, much of the patient with lead as you can and still work and save their life. Then when that's done, send them back out um, and decon them at that point. I don't know that I'd be happy about being that surgeon, um, but those are considered to be national recommendations. Keep everyone warm, separate them by gender, remember that children are lower, and never, ever, ever carry a small child through a decon. Some references. Um, these are guidelines created uh, a couple of years ago by the task force. Some papers, there's that Boston Children's video as well. and. We're just about out of time. Questions? A lot to cover. It's a big, big topic. <laughs> yes. Yes. Ah, at the end, you can't really keep naked pictures. The, the pic <laughs> At the end, it's going to be a face shot. That's a tricky question. Um, yeah, now it's, those are things. Yeah. We've, we've done numbers, so we'll just take a Sharpie and stick a one, two, three, four, five on you. Um, and that, that can definitely aid if you're getting a lot of people. I mean, the, the hope is that a parent will come soon and recognize their children, but if it's a big enough disaster where their parent may not be there. Um, yeah, that's a problem. That's why it's useful to have sort of the whole child picture pre, um, because if it's not the immediate parent, if it's an aunt, an uncle, a grandparent, they may recognize his sneakers and his backpack, but if you just show people a face, you know, a lot of people, some of them look alike. Um, and you can, you can have some issues, but at least that way they would be sure that yes, their child is actually here in this hospital, and now you can go find him. Other questions? Identification in pre-verbal kids is really tough. <laughs> yes? Nope. Well, they'll get braided. They'll, they'll, it'll bring their heart rate down. Um, the question was atropine dosing and heart rate. Um, so if they are tachycardic, um, that will, you know, won't, generally doesn't make them go sky high. 
Um, however, you need it for if they're having sludge symptoms, that'll far outweigh any cardiac changes that you're going to have. And in fact, you're going to be giving very, very large doses in those cases. If you look at sort of adult organophosphate poisons or, or big kids, frequently you're actually giving in the gram range, not milligram range. So you'll, with a, with a serious poisoning. So they're, you're going to be running out of atropine in your hospital. You, just, you don't have to worry about giving too much. 2-PAM, not the same. You can overdose on that, but atropine, no. Other questions? Everybody's hungry. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll be down here if anybody thinks of anything else that they want to add. Thank you for having me.